Good morning. As we, there we go. It is a good morning. It is amazing that we can come and gather and worship and do c declare the greatness of who he is, not only in word, but in song, in preaching, in the taking of communion, and the gathering of his saints. And thus we gather as the redeemed, as friends, as, as guests, to declare and worship God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in truth. With that, please stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 107, verses 1 to 9. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble, and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. This is the word of the Lord.
yes, Lord.
Thank you. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah. Jesus Messiah, 
Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And that's the kind of God we have. One who is gracious and compassionate, to those who fear him. And we have access to him through the Son. Um, so cry out to him. Cry out to him in faith, knowing that he's a God who hears us and cares for his people. Uh, John introduced a song. John introduced the song, um, While the Men Were Away at the Men's Summit, and it's such a rich hymn. And it recounts, uh, it recounts the promises uh, the Lord has made to his people, um, and uh, like the one we just read in Isaiah 41, 10. So it reminds us of our sure hope in the Lord, our assurance that he holds us and keeps us no matter what, because of the sure hope that we have in Christ. saints of the Lord it is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to you for, for refuge to Jesus have fled sing fear not fear not For I am your God and will still give you aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, and cause you to stay upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. shall not overflow for I will be with you your troubles to us and sanctify to you your deepest distress and through fiery trials your shall lie by grace all sufficient shall be your supply the flame shall not hurt you 
do I only desire Thy dross to consume And thy gold to refine Thank you, Lord has leaned for repose I will not I will not desert to his foes that so though all hell should endeavor to shake to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Well, good morning, and welcome to Redeem South Bay, to our time of worship and the proclamation of God's Word. We're so grateful that you're here this morning, our members and our visitors. Save being present with the Lord in glory. There is no better place that we can be right now than to, together with uh, Christ's people the bride of Christ, and to proclaim his greatness and goodness together. Amen? Obviously today also is a, another special day, Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all our mothers this morning. And um, a little bit later we'll be directed uh, through our readings and our reflections regarding that matter. But right now we want to welcome you, if you are a visitor for the first time, to our church. We're so glad that you're with us today and uh, just want to say that we love you. We love you because God first loved us. We know that's true because of the giving of His Son, Jesus Christ, for us. We like to say here often that we love you, and we love you enough to, to tell you the truth. This might sound arrogant, but here's the, the reality. We know the truth. Now, if I say that to my friends or neighbors out in the world, they may say, well, that sounds very proud and prideful and arrogant that... How do you know the truth? We know the truth because the truth is a person, Jesus Christ. And he says that he will set you free, free from your sin, free from bondage, free from works righteousness. And so our prayer for you today is that you also will know the truth embodied in Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. So that is our prayer today. Now we've come to a time in the sermon and the sermon and the service. I'm not preaching yet or preaching today. I'm not wearing my tie, am I? So uh, we've come to the part, part, part in our service when we have what we refer to as our pastoral prayer. Um, we pray for our needs and uh, the needs of our church, our nation. Today we're going to be directed uh, by, I think it's appropriate to listen and be directed, brought by the mother of our Lord, Mary, as she prays her song of pray, praise, which we've referred to as the Magnificat from Luke. And um, let's pray together. Father, we're, th we're thankful for this day. Lord, as your servant Mary has said, Our soul magnifies the Lord. Our spirit rejoices in God, our Savior. He has looked on the humble estate of his servants. Lord, your scripture says that you know our frame. 
that we are but dust. You didn't wait to do it for us to get our act together. You didn't come for those who were high and mighty, those who were full of esteem. But instead, you have looked upon our humble estate. For we need your salvation. We look to you for everything. Every good thing comes from you. Your servant Mary says, For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. And we do. We know what a blessing it was for that dear sister to be the mother of our Lord. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, she proclaims. Lord, we can echo that very prayer, that very praise. Lord, the greatest, the most powerful, omniscient God who is mighty has done great things for us, and your name truly is holy. Lord, in your mercy, you have looked down upon us, and you have come to those who have put their faith and trust in you. Lord, we fear you, God, with reverent, holy fear, for you deserve it. Lord, from generation to generation, all the way from that time until now, your people have put their hope and trust in you. And we pray, and we know, because your promises are true, that from generation to generation, even in the future, all the way until you return, generations will put their hope and trust in you. Lord, you have shown strength with your mighty arm. You have scattered the proud in their thoughts, the thoughts of their hearts. Lord, you, you bring the proud down to nothing, and you lift up the humble. What a mighty God you are. You have brought down the mighty from their thrones. Lord, there are no kings or powers or rulers in this world that can stand before you. Lord, all will look to you. You will bring them down in humility. Lord, you filled the hungry with good things. Lord, you are our satisfaction. And in a moment, even as we've sung and as we take communion, we're reminded that you are the bread of life. You satisfy us. The rich you have sent away empty. You have helped your servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Lord, we are that offspring. We are in the offspring of your son, Jesus Christ. He is the offspring, and we are found inside him, in him, in Christ. And we're reminded that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, today we lift up a number of people in our congregation who continue to need your healing and touch. We pray especially for Jay Dunn and for his ongoing healing after his heart surgery. We pray for his dear wife, Cheryl, as she ministers to him. Give her an extra measure of strength and mercy and grace as she, as she cares for her husband. Lord, even now, as Jay is uh, recovering, may he continue to love his dear wife and to give his life for her, as, just as you have done, dear Savior, for your, your beautiful bride. Lord, we pray for Ray Peterson, ongoing healing and strength for our brother. We're thankful for John Hubbs that he's returned back the last two weeks and he's been with us after his um, health situation. Lord, we pray for him and strengthen, strengthen him, we pray again. Lord, we, we pray for all those in our congregation, Lord, who are mothers today. We ask a special blessing on each one of them. We especially remember as well those who have lost children, either who have gone on or through miscarri- miscarriage or other means. Lord, and, uh, and for those uh, women who desire to be mothers, Lord, it's a, it's a great blessing. We ask a blessing upon each one of these, Lord, and may this be a glorious and blessed day for every mother in this congregation. Lord, now as we turn our hearts toward you in this time of giving of our offerings and receiving of communion, Lord, go before us. Open our hearts to the truth of your gospel again, that we are saved by grace every single day, every single moment. And may we be so grateful for the great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we see 
in the taking of communion, both the bread and the wine that represent his body and blood. And may we give, Lord, with a hilarious giving, Lord, knowing the great joy it is to receive from you and to give back to you as well. Be with us now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are here for the first time, uh, I forgot to get the protocol. The, the place will pass, and uh, there's juice in a double stack cup, juice and the cracker. If you'll take those two cups, if you are a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, and uh, hold on to that for a moment, and I'll come back and lead us in a moment in our time of communion. Two readings today as we reflect on our dear Savior and his incredible sacrifice to us. As I mentioned before, it is Mother's Day, and I felt it appropriate to reflect on Christ through the eyes of his mother. When a child goes through challenges, A father feels it, certainly. But I think there is a a special pain, 
a special way that a mother feels deeply the pain of her child. A father doesn't carry that child in his womb. Fathers can't do that. A mother does that. Carries that child, nurses that child, cares for that child, weeps for that child. And the truth is that Mary did all those things for the incarnate Son of God. After he was born, he was presented to the temple. Listen to this section, and then I'll read one more section as well. From Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of to- turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Later we see the true reality of that as at the cross of our Lord there are a number of people gathered including Mary Jesus own mother from John chapter 19 starting in verse 16 so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha There they crucified him, and with him two robbers, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. 
and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Simeon's prophecy over Mary came true, didn't it? To watch her son being tortured and finally killed on the cruel cross at Golgotha. But the amazing thing is to remember what we know as true Bible-believing Christians is that Mary herself even though the sword is piercing her heart to see her son die, must also come to rejoice because Mary was a sinner, just like you and I. Given a special place in the redemptive story of of our Lord to bring him into this world, to be used as a special blessed vessel, but a sinner nonetheless. And so even as she could watch that happen, and if we were there, we could also as disciples be in great pain as well to see our beloved friend, our master, our teacher, the one we had walked with to die upon that cruel cross, but then also understand that he is who he says he was and is and still is, the Christ, the Son of the living God, one who would raise only in a few days, ascend on high and come to get us all someday. One who died for our sins and even for the sins of his own mother. And so let this Mother's Day be a reflection for us to, yes, bless Mary for her faithfulness, but to remember the profound reality that Jesus Christ has died for all of us, for the sins of the world, And all of our sins, past, present, and future, were taken care of on that day at the cross. The bread is a symbol. Scripture tells us it is his body. And so it's with this that we take the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. We thank you, Jesus, for coming in the flesh, for dying for us on that cruel cross, for taking on the wrath of your Father, for being risen, ascending, and we look forward to seeing you face to face. Let's take the bread. The cup is a symbol, representation of your blood, Jesus Christ. You said, this is your blood. Lord, we take this cup, remembering that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And your blood has washed us clean. You have purified us. What a, what a holy, incredible, amazing mystery. Lord, you have said it, and we believe it. And we now give great thanks because our sins have all been washed away by your blood. We thank you, and we take this now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you love Jesus, say amen. Well, it is Mother's Day, and so with that, we have a little special time that we have here, kind of our tradition for these times. So what I need first is some helpers. So uh, we have a little gift prepared for you, moms. So um, children, if children will come forward, and there's some bags up here. Uh, Hayden, there's also a bag underneath your seat if you pull that out. Uh, grab one of these. Moms, would you please stand? We're going to bless you in a minute, but if you're a mother today, would you please stand? and Children, find a mom and give her one of these gifts.
Okay, mothers, uh, raise your hand. And oh yeah, thank you. Go to the foyer as well. Uh, give me some big kids. Go back to the foyer and get those moms that are back there. Yeah, check out. Thank you very much. Check outside real quickly. Any mothers? Good job. Good call. To the foyer, anybody? Okay. Raise your hands, mothers, if you have yet to receive a gift. Any mothers that have not received a gift? Inside, Linda, inside the, uh, thank you very much. All right, uh, Morgan, I'm sorry, you must be seated. You're not a mother. <laughs> okay, we got one, one more, one more mom right here. Very good. Okay. All right, thank you, children. Good job. Have a seat. Have a seat, children. Good job. Okay, mothers, if you, <clears throat> you've received your gifts, would you please stand again, mothers? If you're sitting near one of our moms, would you uh, put your hand on this mother as we bless them together? Agree with me in prayer. Uh, let's pray. Father, you are a great God. And in your greatness and in your goodness, you have, in your amazing design, you have given us mothers, women who have given us birth. There is no one in this congregation who can say, I don't have a mother. Lord, we all have had mothers. We've been born of woman. And so what a great, what a great gift each of these women has been to us and will be to us. We know there are those in the congregation who have, whose mothers have passed on. We pray a special blessing upon them this day as they remember their mothers who are no longer with us. Thank you for those women. Lord, we know that there are some mothers here who have lost children as well. Lord, we ask a special blessing upon each one of these mothers, whether adult children or children in the womb who have passed away. Lord, you are a gracious God, and you meet them even today, in their time of need. May this be a blessed day for them, even in the midst of this pain. May they seek comfort and know, Lord, that, that your mother also felt great pain. Lord, we thank you for these women. We thank you for our mothers, for their loving care toward us. May they continue to, to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. May they continue to be a blessing to all those around us. And may we bless them. Lord, as husbands of, of the wives that are represented here, Lord, may we uh, die to ourselves and love them as Christ has loved the church. Lord, help us today. May they have a blessed day today as they celebrate with their families in their various ways. And we commit them into your care. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have a little break time here to uh, take the kids to classes. Uh, if you have children to go to class, you may take them now and let's stand and greet each other for a moment. Good morning, church. If you can make your way to your seats, make your way back in from the foyer. We'd love to continue our time together with a few announcements. It is good to gather together and worship the Lord. Amen. Where would be a better place for you right now than right here with the saints? Those who have been purchased and bought by, with Christ's precious blood, who have been made new creations in Christ, who are longing for his return, and who are seeking to live and obey them uh, with their lives. You get to be with those sorts of people who are precious to the Lord and, be, and share this time this morning, learning from God's word, worshiping him, and uh, loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. What a blessing. Amen. A few announcements that we'd like to make here. Uh, you can find these in your bulletin. So if you want to just make sure that you get a bulletin and look at a few of these, some of these uh, have a lot of details to them. So I want to just uh, bring them before you. Uh, but first of all, I want to announce one that's not in the bulletin. And uh, that's this green flyer right here, which you could get in the foyer. And uh, essentially what this is, is this is a Fellowship of Christian Athletes soccer league that's just starting. 
Um, some of you ha maybe have some friends who are volunteering uh, with FCA or Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, the South Bay West area director, his name's Tom Sheck. He's an elder at uh, Kings Harbor Church. A few years ago, he was pitching the vision for this to me, and I thought that this was awesome. So they, they're starting some uh, like soccer and basketball leagues that they're doing in the summertime um, for younger kids. So for example, this soccer one that's coming up is for kids aged five to 10, uh, and you come, and it's about seven, eight weeks long of a, of a league, and you come, and the kids will hear the gospel at each practice, and then they'll hear the gospel at the games as well. Uh, and so uh, if soccer's your thing or basketball and you're interested in maybe helping FCA, uh, they, would be, they would love to have more people help them. Um, but another way that we can bless them is even just by putting our five to 10 year old uh, in the soccer league, joining. It's a neat opportunity if, you're, if your little ones uh, are, are not that skilled at soccer, it's developmental. So these are not like going to be the pro kids, <laughs> you know, uh, who are really, really good these days. It's insane. Uh, like they could beat me, you know, <laughs> and they're like seven. So this is developmental. It's friendly. Get to hear the gospel. And if you bring your kid and you want to bring a, a neighbor's a friend who's not a believer, they get to hear the gospel uh, at the practices and at, at the games. So uh, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, we'd love for you to grab one of these. The league is going to go from June 15th to August 3rd. Uh, and so you can uh, ask me if you want to learn more about that or make sure you get one of one of these flyers as well. Uh, also coming up, we have a uh, we have the Walk for Life, um, which will be uh, coming up here this next Saturday. And so um, many of you guys know that uh, we we encourage uh, involvement and support for the Pregnancy Help Center. It's one of the only pro-life pregnancy uh, help centers in our area. And so uh, also we have the uh, the joy of having Carly. Where's Carly at? Carly right here uh, is on the board. She's the, the treasurer. Tre treasurer. No, I messed it up. Secretary. Uh, so she's a secretary and, and serves on the board there, which has been awesome. And so she's helping us put together a redeemed team uh, for the Walk for Life. And so, um, again, this is May 18th. This is upcoming Saturday, Saturday at Veterans Park in Redondo Beach. And um, if you'd like to join the team, then you can contact her. Or if you'd like to sponsor uh, a member so that they can go and, and, and give and support, uh, then you can you could do that as well. You can ask all your questions to Carly. Um, additionally, you can sign up at support phctorrance.org and click on the uh, WFSLB button, um, which is Walk for Life South. I think that's Walk for South Life Bay. Now, I don't know what that is. What is that? Do you know what that stands for? Oh, click on the WFSLB tab. <laughs> So lovely. Um, also, uh, we wanted to let you guys know we had we had two brothers recently, um, young brothers who were uh, applying to college, uh, and and the discussion came up about a church matching scholarship. And so we were praying and thinking about as elders what we wanted to do with uh, opportunities like that. And so uh, we just wanted to put it in an announcement since we approved. Uh, a church matching scholarship for these two brothers. We wanted to make it public and let you guys know uh, that if you are uh, seeking to attend college or university uh, that will you know, uh, match church scholarship funds, then you can reach out to us. Uh, we have some caveats. The students must be church members attending elder approved uh, post high school programs, actively serving in our church and majoring or minoring in biblical or theological studies. Uh, and so we want to, if you're looking to invest in studying and, you know, or minoring in biblical studies uh, and, and your school has a church matching scholarship, reach out to us and we want, we would love to, uh, prayerfully think about investing in you for that. Uh, so I just wanted to make that known to you guys. Uh, also coming up here, we have our teacher work party on Tuesday, May 28th. And so save the date for those of you who are serving in Redeemed Kids. And please RSVP to Penny by uh, Sunday, May 26th. Also, we're excited to uh, announce the bibli biblical counseling class that's going to be offered here uh, at the church by Michael Briggs. And so if you're free on a, on a Tuesday night, uh, you can come from June 4th to uh, August 13th. Uh, there won't be a meeting in between there on June 25th, but it'll be Tuesday 7 to 8.30 p.m. And you get to just spend that time together uh, working through a book uh, called A Practical Guide for Effective Biblical Counseling. And so you can you can pick up that book, please pick up that book and, and sign up, email Michael Briggs uh, if you're interested and would like to sign up for that class. Also, uh, 
if there's child, if you need child care in order to attend that class, he'd love to, to help facilitate that as well. And so if you could just email him that you have that need and how many kids uh, that you would, you would need to be uh, looked after so that you uh, or you and your wife could, could join that, that biblical counseling class. One of the things that's uh, awesome is that we are always offering people counsel. We're all counseling people at some degree or another, whether it's our neighbor, uh, whether it's, you know, it's our kids, uh, whether it's uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who call us and text us and like, what should I do about this? Uh, and so please, uh, if you want to grow and, and just have a, a just more clear understanding of how can I counsel better and more biblically, this is a great class for you. Uh, so please check that out. Uh, last thing I want to announce here is that... Uh, we continue to need more and more volunteers. And so if, if you're able to help us out uh, in, in serving and picking up one of these responsibilities, that would be a, a huge blessing uh, to us. Um, we're sensing that it's difficult to keep the different um, areas that our church needs to be served in filled. Uh, and so we just want you to know that. Uh, we're praying that, that, that people would, would step in and, and help out a little more in these practical ways on, on a Sunday. And so you can see that we need uh, help with setup, help with bringing food, and help with, uh, with teardown as well. Uh, teardown is probably one of the biggest needs right now. And so if you can even commit to just once a month, stay till the food's done, you know, help tear down uh, and serve in that capacity. That would be, that would be a huge uh, blessing for us because um, most of us go home and— you know, there's good, loving, hardworking people who have to do that cleanup, have to do that pickup afterward. Uh, and so having a full group for that uh, is ideal to make that go as quick as possible so that they can finish up and so that uh, everyone can be in their, in their homes and with their families and having their neighbors over and, and all those sorts of things on Sunday afternoon. Uh, so if you could prayerfully consider helping us fill those, that would be a, a huge blessing, um, especially if you're not, if, 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 if you're, ser you're not serving in any capacities at all yet, uh, please come talk to, to me or some of the other pastors and, and we'll, we'll connect you and, 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 and get you signed up. Uh, so that would be a huge blessing. So please help us out in, in that way. With that said, our church is a church that has a plurality of elders. Uh, we rotate the preaching of God's word, so you'll typically hear from a different pastor each week. Uh, we work through books of the Bible in an expository preaching fashion, which just means that we, we're pretty much, uh, whatever the point of that verse is, or the point of the passage, or the point of the chapter, that's the point of our sermon. We believe the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures, and, and it's uh, the meaning that the Spirit gave to communicate to us that is what we need for life and godliness. And so we're going to preach the word to you. We're working through Genesis, uh, and we get to hear from Pastor Kenny this morning. And so before we, though, hear the word of God preached, let's stand and sing praise to God one more time uh, as we ask him to prepare our hearts to receive the preaching of his word. Our salvation. 
Grace and peace be multiplied to you by the Lord who is our salvation. Please open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 29 will be our text this morning. Genesis 9 beginning at verse 18. I do now invite you to hear and receive the inspired and authoritative word of the triune God. Let it be known that he is the only true God, 
And when we read his word, you hear the very voice of God. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. Pray with me. Father in heaven, We come to you with great confidence through your beloved Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We just sung that the Lord is our salvation, and we believe that, and we stand firmly upon that. Thus, we come asking confidently that you would help us to receive your word, that you would help us to hear your word, that you would help us to apply your word. Lord, we need your word. We need the truth therein. We need to be transformed by your spirit through the proclamation of the word. And this is what we're asking that you would do first and foremost for your glory's sake, knowing that it's for our good and for the benefit of those under our influence. Move amongst your people, we ask. Spirit of the living God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There is a sense in which the Bible is God's major story told through various minor stories, if you will. Scripture has one main character, the triune God. Can I get an amen? That's what the Bible's about. And yet this one main character reveals himself to and through other characters of the Bible. And with this morning's text, we come to an end of the story of Noah. And yes, God continues this story. He will continue to carry out his plans and purposes through Noah's offspring. But Noah's era ceases with the passage that we read this morning. And I suggest that Noah's story is the second minor story in the meta narrative of Scripture. First, we have the story of God and Adam. And then we have the story of God and Noah. Or we could say that first came the story of God and the emergence of the earth and life. And second came the story of God and the reemergence of earth and life. I often think of the story of Noah as a sequel to the story of Adam. So many similarities that we see. And as many of you know, the first minor story ended disastrously. Man had succumbed to the temptation of the serpent. Man had rebelled and sinned against his creator. Man had broken fellowship with his God. Yet, God made a gracious promise that a day would come wherein he would crush the head of the serpent through the offspring of the woman. And although there were glimmers of hope for mankind throughout this first minor story, the overwhelming reality was simply this. Sin is far worse than you could ever imagine. 
Therefore, it needed to be dealt with. Or more specifically, as Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 reads, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man. We have to wrestle with that. This is because of our rebellion against God. I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But just as this first minor story comes to an end, the very next verse introduces the second minor story of Scripture, the story of God and Noah. Genesis 6, 8 reads, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You should be jumping out of your seats. That's good news. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. For several weeks, what we've been doing is we have been preaching through the story of God and, Noah's, uh, God and Noah in Genesis, and we have witnessed several things. We have witnessed the absolute heinousness of sin. We have had to wrestle with the fact that man, that, that all men, meaning mankind, that you and I are sinners. And our sin is against the one who made us to enjoy him forever. We've wrestled and witnessed the utter holiness and total righteousness of God. We've had to wrestle with the fact, quite frankly, that God hates sin. He detests it. He abhors it. Sin is foreign to the nature of God, completely other than the pure nature of God, and God righteously judges sin. And we just can't miss this. Please don't miss this, that God wiped out mankind via the flood because man was evil or wicked or sinful or use whatever synonym you want to use, but acknowledge that you and I are wicked and evil and sinful. Yet, we have also witnessed the overwhelming mercy of God. Yes, mankind was evil, Noah included, yet God spared Noah and his three sons and all their wives. And if you don't have some semblance, some understanding of the evil of sin and the holiness of God, then you will never, ever see the mercy of God on display in saving, sparing eight individuals. But his mercy is totally on display, totally on display. He spares eight. And then we've witnessed the undeniable grace of God. If God's mercy is having pity on and being compassionate toward sinners, then God's Grace is his favorable, favorable disposition toward and his bestowal of gifts to sinners like you and me. Amazing. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. And perhaps we see God's grace most keenly in the story of Noah through the Noahic covenant. Noah is blessed, Noah's family is blessed, the whole animate world is blessed, and then God promises that while the post-flood earth remains, the earth as we now know it, it will be a suitable place for man to live upon and to flourish. And here we are, thousands of years later, experiencing the grace of God. Amazing. Amazing. Although there are indications that the post-flood world would still have problems, the overwhelming sense, at least up to this point in the story of Noah, is that God has granted man a new beginning of sorts. However, 
our passage reveals that this new beginning does not meet our ultimate needs. Thus, I have entitled this sermon, A New Beginning, question mark. Yes, the story of Noah is the sequel to the story of Adam, but we need more than a sequel. We need a brand new beginning. In many ways, our passage this morning closes the story of Noah and introduces and forecasts, if you will, the rest of the Bible. Specifically, and this is the main point of today's sermon, Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 through 29 reveals the remaining need for a new beginning in seven steps so that we might understand and anticipate God's faithfulness. So that we might understand and anticipate God's absolute faithfulness. So let's begin. We'll go one by one through these steps. Step number one, a new, a new scene in verses 18 and 19. Once again, the text reads, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Verse 18 recalls chapter 8, verse 15. Remember, it says in chapter 8, verse 15, Then God said to Noah, Go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Jump down to verse 18. So Noah did what God told him to do. He went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. I always like to think about what that might have been like. A year, maybe more on an ark and all you see is water. If you're like me, you're not the best swimmer around. So that makes you a little bit uncomfortable. And for the very first time, the boat settles and you put your foot on dry land. And maybe you get this sense of God has saved us. You look around and maybe say, well, what are we going to do now? But of course, God gives direction. And our verse recalls this very scene. But now Ham is identified as the father of Canaan. In one sense, this indicates that the offspring of Noah were fruitful, and they multiplied as God had commanded. But this small detail anticipates for us the problem with Ham, and anticipates for us the curse of Canaan just a few verses later. And verse 19 for us highlights an essential truth. These three were the sons of Noah, and listen to this, from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. This is the truth of mankind's common ancestry. Genesis 1 and 2 first declared that all humans descended from Adam and Eve, and our passage picks up on that very same theme. From Noah came three sons, and from these three sons came the people of the entire earth. Later in Genesis, we'll see how these people were dispersed over the face of the earth. But for now, it's important for us to affirm what the Bible clearly teaches. That is, there is one human race, and from that one human race, multiple ethnicities come. I don't know if it's just me, but maybe you've noticed that the topics of Race and ethnicity are hot topics. Anyone else notice that? Okay, we're in this together. I have so many jokes coming through my mind, but I'm going to stay on task. (laughs) Hot topics. And Christian, listen to me. We have to get this right. We have to get this right. And we have to be clear because the Bible is clear on the topics of race and ethnicity. On one hand, some want to argue that seemingly everything is racism. On the other hand, some want to argue that seemingly nothing is racism. 
the whole discussion, and we're doing good even if we get there. If we can get to a place where we can have a discussion about it, we're in a good spot. Most people don't want to discuss it. The whole discussion, if we can even have a discussion, is emotional for some, it's experiential for some, and it's often misunderstood or totally avoided. But I got good news. The Bible gives us everything we need for life and godliness, including the issues of race and ethnicity. And so all we have to do, Christian, is be consistent with what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. So let's consider first what the Bible doesn't say. Let's, let's go to some dictionaries. If you were to look up the term race in a dictionary, you'd probably have a good time and laugh. So many wild definitions. Most often, as I looked up the term race in dictionaries, you'll see it defined in terms of ethnicity or as an ethnic group. For example, one dictionary said, race is each of the major groupings into which humankind is considered to be divided on the basis of physical characteristics or shared ancestry. Any problems with that definition according to the Bible? Well, let me point out two. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir up here. All humans, catch me now, have the same physical characteristics. If you were to close your eyes and come tap me in the arm, and Nelson and I are about the same size, and you, and you, you tap him in the arm, you know what you're going to feel? You're going to feel some skin. That's what you're going to feel. We have eyes, and we have ears, and we have bones, and we have muscles. These are the physical characteristics that we share. And yes, I realize that I am darker than most people in this room, but, but is the brownness of my skin a physical attribute? Ponder that. We share the same physical attributes. Number two, and this is my favorite, according to the Bible, we all have shared ancestry. We all have shared ancestry. So I don't have the luxury to go back just, I don't know, a few centuries and solely derive my ancestry from there. We have to go back to the beginning, to Adam, and then to Noah and his sons. And so race, rightly defined, is a group of people descended from a common ancestor. And in this sense, there is but one human race. Can I get an amen? amen? We're all on the same page. That brings us to the concept of ethnicity. An ethnic group refers to a subgroup of people within the singular human race. An ethnic group refers to a subgroup of people within the singular human race who share the same culture, language, and history. I could go on and on all the definitions, but that's a fair definition of what an ethnic group is. Broadly speaking, we can speak of many ethnicities in terms of nations. The Greek term ethnos, where we get ethnic, is often translated as nations. But even within nations, there are smaller ethnic groups, such as tribes or families or language groups. Okay, so why is this important? Why is this important? Uh, first, simply because God said so. God's word is so clear on this. And he said so. The Bible teaches one human race with multiple ethnic groups, and so therefore it's important because there's nothing unimportant in this book. Amen? Second, because one human race with multiple, multiple ethnic groups, that, that's not going anywhere. You're stuck with it for all eternity. Turn with me to the book of Revelation. We're just going to look at a few verses. First, we're going to look at Revelation 5.9. And if you were with us when Brother Aaron Tryock came and preached, he preached this text 
You can look it up on our website, and he'll give you wonderful insight and definitions to these various terms. Revelation chapter 5. Here we're in the heavenly worship scene. There is weeping because no one is able to take the scroll from the Father, but then the lion, who is also the lamb, is able to take the scroll because he was slain. And in this scene, we have a new song, beginning in verse 9. It says, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. So by his blood, he ransomed humans, people of the human race, for God. The text continues from, from, from where? From every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign upon the earth. Human race. From that human race, some are saved from every tribe and language and people and nation. If we turn over to Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter of the Bible. Actually, let's stop in Revelation 21 first. We have this scene, the, the new Jerusalem coming down, heaven meets earth, and we have this heaven on earth reality where God will dwell with his people. In Revelation 21, verse 24, after John indicates that God gives light to the city and its lamp is the lamb, Verse 24 says, by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will ne never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Verse 26, they will bring into it, the city, the glory and the honor of the nations. We look at Revelation 22, verse 2. It says, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. That's the eternal state we're talking about in Revelation 21 and 22. That's perfection, and guess what still exists? Ethnicities or nations. So what does this practically mean for us? What does this practically mean for us? It means that we, as Christians are to honor the unity of the human race and the diversity of ethnicity as laid out in Scripture. Specifically, we ought to rejoice in the corporate nature of God's people while not diminishing the various ethnicities within the people of God. Therefore, we have no room for slander. We have no room for disdain. We have no room for disrespect toward anyone because of their ethnicity nor do we have any room to exalt one ethnicity over any other ethnicity. The common concept of racism is often undefined. Be careful getting into conversations without defined terms because everything can become racism. The way you looked at me was racist. The common concept of racism is often undefined or, or poorly defined, but the biblical concept of ethnocentrism is real. Two words here, ethnicity, center, put them together, ethnocentrism. What happens, I'm stepping on someone's toes, we'll get there eventually. What happens in Genesis 11? The people are trying to make a name for themselves, and God confuses their language and disperses them on the face of the earth. You know what doesn't go away? the heart issue of trying to make a name for yourself. So we all try to make a name for ourselves. You know the easiest way to do that? Gather with people who share the same language and exalt yourself and look down upon others. And so this is the problem that we have, ethnocentrism. The biblical concept of ethnocentrism is real. There's nothing new under the sun. It's here now. It's been here for a long time since Genesis 11, I would argue. But Christ but Christ obliterated ethnocentrism 
for his people. For in him there is no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer circumcised or uncircumcised, no longer barbarian, that would be Gentiles that aren't Greeks, nor Scythian, nor slave, nor free, for we are all one in Christ. We can see that in Galatians 3. We can see that in Colossians 3. So, beloved, the first 11 chapters of the Bible bring so much clarity on the issues of race and ethnicity. So much clarity. Moreover, Christ died for his elect, which comprises every ethnic group. So we need to be clear on our thoughts and on our words and on our deeds in these areas of race and the ethnicity. I, I beg you, Christian, brother and or sister, please don't be the person that is informed by the world about race and ethnicity. Please don't. Rather, emphasize the unity that Christ alone brings to his people in their various ethnicities. All said, the new scene in our verse is that there's one human race, and the sons of Noah, as the progenitors of the human race, point to the reality that these three will be dispersed into nations as will be seen in the forthcoming chapters of the book of Genesis. And this brings us to a new vocation, a new vocation. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. We're not quite sure what Noah's vocation was prior to the flood, but here we see that he's a cultivator of the soil. And there's a sense in which Noah is another Adam, if you will, and that just like Adam worked in and kept the Garden of Eden, so also now Noah works the ground. The text tells us that he planted a vineyard, and we will shortly find out that his vineyard produced crop. For the vineyard to produce rain would have been necessary. These are the musings you have as you're thinking through preaching a text. I, I wonder what Noah's first rain after the flood would have been like. What was he thinking? Was he fearful? Oh, I've seen this before. Did he trust God and take him at his word? I got the covenant. I'm not fearful. You'll keep your word. I have no idea what Noah's thoughts were, but I do know this. Praise the Lord for his faithfulness. God was faithful. God was faithful to his word. For this time... The rains fell upon the vineyard and produced life rather than the rain following, falling and destroying life. Nevertheless, Noah's new vocation seems to have led to a new sin that resulted in a new nakedness. This brings us to a new nakedness, and I specifically highlight verse 21 as a new nakedness because that's the emphasis of the text is Noah's nakedness and what Ham does with it afterward. Nevertheless, it was his drunkenness that resulted in that nakedness. Verse 21 reads, He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. The text does not indicate whether Noah was trying to get drunk or whether he was not trying to get drunk. The, the text simply says that he did. The grammar allows for it to be understood as Noah's drunkenness happening incidentally. But we don't get those details. Noah got drunk, and he got naked. And we need to be careful here. On one hand, we know that wine was not forbidden for God's people in Israel. We have texts such as Judges 9.13 and Psalm 104, verse 15, that indicate that wine was used to cheer one's heart. We have other texts that indicate that wine seems to be used for medicinal purposes, or at least as a sedative, such as Proverbs 31.6, but on the other hand, both the Old Testament and the New Testament warn against excessive drinking and absolutely condemn drunkenness. I want you to look with me at Proverbs chapter 23. 
This is one of the strongest warnings in Scripture. regarding consuming too much alcohol. Proverbs chapter 23, beginning at verse 29. The text reads, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaining? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Answer, verse 30. Those who tarry long over wine... Those who try to, those who go to try mixed wine, do not look at wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup and goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart utter perverse things. It will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, like one who lies on top of a mast. They struck me, you will say, but I was not hurt. They beat me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake? I must have another drink. Both our passage back in Genesis chapter 9 and Genesis 19 describe drunkenness as an occasion for lewdness. And as you work your way through the Bible, you're going to see that that's consistent. That drunkenness and sexual immorality or lewdness go hand in hand. Simply put, drunkenness often leads to more serious sin. And it's not my goal to bind anyone's conscience or to take away God-given freedom from those in our midst who choose to enjoy a glass of wine every now and again. But I do want to speak very plainly and very pastorally. Christian, drunkenness is not an option for you. Drunkenness is not an option for you. It does not matter if you set out to get drunk or if it happened by incident. If you are exercising your freedom to drink alcohol and if it leads to intoxication, then you need to put the alcohol away. You need to put the alcohol away. If you are drinking to the point of intoxication, we're here to help you. We're here to help you. I would argue that this is a great day if you're struggling with drinking to talk to one of your pastors, to talk to a trusted Christian, confess and be helped. I'm telling you that hiding your sin of drunkenness will hurt you, it will hurt your loved ones, it'll mar your witness. And it very well could ruin your life. But most importantly, you cannot honor and enjoy God by hiding your sin of drunkenness or any sin for that matter. Drunkenness is a dark, dark place to be. And I would beg you, as your pastor and as your brother in the Lord, to walk in the light to walk in the love of God, to take it upon yourself, to confess, repent, and walk with your brothers and sisters in Christ, in unity. I plead with you, if you're struggling, and a member of our church, to let it be known today. That said, no drunkenness is not the main issue in our text, but I couldn't not address this congregation. Rather, the result of Noah's drunkenness is Noah laid uncovered in his tent. Adam sinned and covered his nakedness. Now Noah sinned and uncovers his nakedness. One commentator put it this way. This is so stark. He says this of Noah, he who kept his ground against the waters of the great flood succumbs to wine. Another commentator noted, intoxication and sexual looseness are hallmarks of pagans. 
And both are traced back to this event in Noah's life. Man had not changed at all. With the opportunity to start a new creation, Noah acted like a pagan. This incident in Noah's life highlights the realities of Genesis 6, verse 5, which we read earlier in Genesis 8, verse 21, which reads, When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. And the Lord acknowledges, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. In this one verse, Noah displays that he is not the one who will crush the head of the serpent. Thus, we see our need for another new beginning. The great harm that drunkenness can be for one's family is revealed in this story. Well, Noah's drunkenness and nakedness were shameful enough, it was the act of his son Ham that takes center stage in verse 22, a new dishonoring. The text read, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Once again, the special note that Ham was the father of Canaan, coupled with his improper behavior, foreshadows the curse that will come upon Canaan. When I was first studying this text, I was, I was struck by how far we have seemingly come. I think most people in our culture today would read this text and say, what's the big deal? So what? The majority of our culture applauds adult nudity in all forms and suggests or sometimes even demands that adult bodies are better when they're bare. However, the Bible teaches that a husband's body is his wife's, that a wife's body is her husband's, and the necessary outcome is really quite simple. If you don't have a spouse as defined by the Bible, then you don't have a body to bear in the presence of another. Period. Now, if you say what I just said, at best, you're going to be called a prude. You may be accused of using hate speech. These are the times that we live in. But we'll stand upon the word of God, and I will digress. To the ancients, the concept of a grown child seeing his own father nude was against family ethic. It was unwanted, unheard of. It was shocking, quite frankly. The father would have been demoralized, and his strength would have been thought of as weakened. And there are several theories about what the phrase saw the nakedness of his father means. I won't get into those. Happy reading in the commentaries. However, the plain meaning of the text is clearly the best option. Ham observed with his eyes Noah's nakedness. And the fact that in the very next verse, Shem and Japheth cover their father's nakedness with a garment strengthens the plain understanding of the text. It seems that Ham was in the wrong place at the wrong time, he stumbled in to see his naked father, and although that should have been humiliating for both Noah and for Ham, Ham ultimately dishonored his father by proactively seeking out his brothers to tell them what, they, what he had seen. The text indicates that his brothers were outside the tent, and so he goes and he tells them, and ultimately, Ham dishonored God by not respecting God's order of authority in the household. Ham's faulty moral compass foretells of the moral disregard that his progeny, the Canaanites, would display through their own moral acts later in Scripture. While Ham dishonors, Shem and Japheth honor. We see a new honoring in verse 23. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Everything that, sh that Ham should have done, Shem and Japheth do. 
rather than talk, rather than gossip, rather than ridicule, rather than mock, Shem and Japheth remain silent and only act to honor their father. We would do well to learn from Shem and Japheth. You know what's easy? It's easy to see something that maybe you shouldn't have done or rather that you shouldn't have seen and then exacerbate the problem by running our mouths. That's easy. Rather than taking the appropriate actions to help the situation with, when it's within our power to do so. Shem and Japheth honor their father. They honor their father even in his dishonorable state by being extremely careful to do what was right before God to their father. The main point of our passages is not moral behavior. However, morally upright behavior flows from our relationship with God and our trust in his word. And later on, we're going to see in just a few verses that the Lord, that Yahweh is the God of Shem. And I suggest that it was his relationship with the Lord that caused him to honor his father. And I just want to encourage us as a church, us as children, to allow our relationship with the Lord to serve as the impetus to honor those who maybe at times are dishonorable. The Lord sees it, he knows it, he'll deal with it. Strive to honor those who have been placed in authority over you. At this point, we see that this so-called new beginning is what I like to call, quite simply, a hot mess. This brings us to a new trajectory. Step number six. Verses 24 through 27, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Noah became aware of what his youngest son had done to him, and Noah speaks for the very first time in the book of Genesis. We know a lot about Noah, but he says nothing until this verse. And he said, cursed be Canaan. Many take issue with these words because Canaan, Ham's offspring, receives a curse seemingly for what his father Ham had done. There are many suggestions as to why Canaan receives a curse instead of Ham. One suggestion is that Excuse me, Canaan being Ham's youngest is cursed because Ham was Noah's youngest. There are a lot of interesting theories as to why this was the case. It seems to be that Noah's expression of a curse is a desire or a wish that he is praying to God for. He's calling out to God. And this is different than when God pronounces a curse. When God pronounces a curse, it's declarative and effective, period. But when a human, in this case Noah, pronounces a curse, it can be considered as a request. It seems to me that Noah's curse on Canaan and his subsequent blessings on his other sons are requests made by Noah to God that really serve as the introduction to the nations that follow in the coming chapter. In other words, these curses and blessings have national implications that will be carried out in the rest of Scripture. Specifically, we begin to see whom God will choose and whom God will not choose to fulfill his Genesis 3, 15 promise through. In one sense, Noah's curse can be considered as gracious in that if Noah desired for Ham to 
be cursed, and perhaps all of Ham's offspring could have incurred neg negative ramifications. And perhaps it's not so much so that Canaan, the individual, is desired to be cursed, but rather the Canaanites as a nation are desired to be cursed. The specific motivations, quite frankly, are not given to us in the text. The motivations for Noah's expressing a curse on Canaan are not specified. Later in Scripture, we see passages in Jeremiah, passages in Ezekiel that make it clear for us that a son does not get punished for his father's sin. But that said, it's also typical for a son to follow in his father's footsteps. Like father, like son, we so often hear. So perhaps it could be the case that Canaan and his offspring continued in the same immoral path as Ham did, and Noah makes this request of a curse known to God, and God in turn punishes the Canaanites for their deeds. Regardless of the specific reason why Noah uttered these words against Canaan, the nature of the curse is not one of obliteration, but rather it's one of subjugation. Specifically, Noah's cursed be Canaan is simply that Canaan would be a lowly servant to his brothers, and that would in turn, and that would, would turn out to be the case on a national level, level as we see in the rest of Scripture. Noah's curse be Canaan is followed by a blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. In other words, it is not Shem who directly receives the blessing, but rather he receives it indirectly as Noah directly blesses Yahweh himself. And I think what we start to see here is that motif of the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of the woman. Whether Noah was aware of it or not, the Canaanites would carry out the deeds of the serpent, while Shem's line would produce Abram, who would ultimately lead to the seed of the woman, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In this way, the God of Shem, Yahweh that is, is blessed, and the line of Canaan would be his servant. Lastly, we have Noah's request for Japheth. He requested that Japheth would be enlarged to dwell in the tents of Shem and to let Canaan also serve Japheth. Many commentators note that Japheth's line represents the Gentiles to the west. And they suggest that even this early in the book of Genesis, that Gentile inclusion is alluded to and becomes even more explicit in the Abrahamic covenant. In the immediate context, this request is that Japheth, Japheth's line will occupy large territory, dwell peaceably alongside yet under Shem's line. In all, Noah's words set the tone for the future relationships between the Canaanites, between the Israelites, and the sea peoples to the west. As you know, the Canaanites were to be driven from their land and only accepted as servants by Israel, and this is indeed the new trajectory for the peoples of the earth. And now after seeing so many news we're finally brought to our seventh and final step, an old reminder. Verses 28 and 29. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Noah lived for a long time, and then he died. And this is the stark and old reminder of sin and sin's consequence, death. I'm going to die. You're going to die. And we need to let that sink in. I'm going to die. You're going to die because we are one human race and because our first parents sin, and because everyone who followed after them incurred that nature and also sins, we're going to die. God said, you may surely eat of the tree of the garden, of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. 
From the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Later the serpent said to the woman, regarding the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Satan's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So Eve and then Adam partook of the fruit, and they incurred death, and so do their offspring. We see it in Noah's story, and in this way, our passage reveals the remaining need for a new beginning. As we work our way through the book of Genesis, and if we were to work our way through the rest of the Old Testament, we find and we would find the repetition of this old reminder. Sin and death. Sin and death. Sin and death. But don't you dare forget that sprinkled throughout the Old Testament, we get promise after promise. Promise after promise. Saints and friends, the author of life came to earth. Truly God, truly man, his name is Jesus. You see, in the beginning, this beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And yet, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. Amazing. He came to his own, his own people did not receive him, but to all who did, or to all who would, or to all who will receive him. He gave them the right to become children of God. Unbelievable. How do we become a child of God? How do we become a child of God? Well, we believe in his name. And it's because we're born not by blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but by the will of God. The word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. His name is Jesus. He's the way, and the truth, and the life. His name is Jesus. And just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so... Righteousness came into the world through one man and life through his righteousness. His name is Jesus. This Jesus says things like this. I promise I'm almost done. I know you guys need to eat for Mother's Day. He says things like this. I'm, I'm the resurrection and the life. Sin and death, sin and death, sin and death. Here I am, I'm on the scene, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He says things like that so that we can say things like this. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what are we to do? What are we to do? I love what Paul says after that text I just read out of 1 Corinthians 15. He says, therefore, beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Saints, your labor is not in vain. You stand firm. 
You're immovable all by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. You fight and you strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We fall down and we get up. We see our brother or sister down and we yank them up. We speak the truth in love when it hurts and when it feels good. We hold one another accountable. We serve the Lord by serving one another. And we do this knowing that the remaining need for a new beginning will be met. I close with this passage. Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, look, see, I'm making all things new. That's terrible timing. And also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, to the thirsty. Do you thirst today? Do you thirst? To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murder, murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Lord, we're asking that you would bless and encourage and enliven your precious people in the context of this place to delight in the reality that death has been defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the resurrection and the life, and to all who believe in him, though we might die, yet we will live. For everlasting life is ours, and the Lord Jesus Christ came to give us life and life abundantly. So help us, O oh God, to be in awe of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, O oh God, by the power of your spirit, shower us with your grace that we might even now Renew ourselves unto you to walk in the power of the Spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh. Oh, death, where's your sting? We live in Christ. Praise be to God. Amen. Let's all stand and worship our Lord. God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. Own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your hope. How love and purchase me, make me yours forevermore. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, did not know. No taste for heaven's joys. And then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me. Through the gospel of your son, it gave me endless.
have any prayer needs, the elders are up front to receive you, to pray with you, to talk with you about whatever might be on your heart. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 serves as our benediction. May the God of peace brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you, saints, with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. All God's people said, amen. Happy Mother's Day. God bless you all.